Welcome to the discussion series on free trade and liberalization as part of the 1991 project at the Mercatus Center. I'm Shruti Rajagopalan, and in this conversation series, I will be talking trade with Professor Arvind Panagarya, who is the director of the Deepak and Neera Raj Center on Indian Economic Policies and the Jagdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University. In the past, he has served as the first vice chairman of the Niti Aayog in Government of India and as chief economist of the Asian Development Bank. He's the author of a number of books, but for today's conversation in particular, we will focus on his recent book, Free Trade and Prosperity. Welcome, Arvind. Hi, Shruti. Very pleased to be back with you. Thank you for joining us for, uh, you know, episode three uh, and, and talking trade and reforms. I want to talk today uh, about a few aspects of protectionism as a continuation of our conversation last time. So in the last episode, you detailed the various reasons why the infant industry arguments against free trade are misguided. Uh, Today, I want to go over some of the other common arguments against uh, free trade and for protectionism, especially in developing countries. Uh, and I would request you to perhaps, you know, ex uh, expand on each of them and tell us if these have any merit, whether it's a question of information externalities or diversification, you know, or coordination questions, you know, capital market problems, uh, import substitutions, the bias against imports and the bias to Towards exports. Uh, these are just themes that have popped up over and over again, starting in the 60s and 70s in India. But these themes are, and arguments are very much alive today. And they're always brought forward in some kind of new packaging, you know, to serve up uh, protectionist policies. So I think it would be very, very helpful uh, if we could go through each of these arguments and, and you know, we could get your take on them. Wonderful, Shruti. So um, let's begin with the, you know, um, uh, uh, diversification and information externalities. Um, now, the, this, the, the diversification argument has itself, you know, come uh, 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 in, in two different forms. Um, first, you know, there was the early diversification argument that was used, particularly in the Indian context, that we wanted a diversified structure of industry. And uh, uh, as a part of that, you know, we went in and uh, because, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the constituency for open markets was uh, almost non-existent, uh, we almost went, India almost went uh, to the extreme of uh, offering what might, one might call, you know, uh, protection on demand. Um, uh, uh, and, and or uh, sometimes, you know, in the earlier literature, uh, particularly Max Corden, I think, used this term made to measure protection, something of that sort. I forget. You know, but uh, um, uh, uh, so the, the the point was that if anybody said that, you know, uh, here is a product that the country is importing, uh, but I want to produce it at home. And we said, OK. You know, we will uh, uh, we will simply uh, prohibit the import of the product. Uh, so this is pretty much, you know, uh, anybody who who is willing to uh, produce uh, the the same product that's being imported would get protection. Another way we did it was, you know, that uh, uh, under investment licensing, we would say that well you know, we'll give you the license. So think of it, you know, that suppose these are tube lights. <laughs> Somebody says I'll produce tube lights, but of course, you know, I'll have to import the parts. Uh, well, say, well, all right, you know, we'll allow you for four years to uh, import the parts uh, and issue the, you the license for X number of tube lights to be produced. Uh, but uh, within four years, you have to indigenize the product. Uh, meaning, so you, you the, the diversification here meant you, uh, not only producing, uh, assembling the tube light, but also uh, uh, ultimately source the the uh, uh, components uh, yeah. that are assembled uh, locally, uh, and that could mean either you yourself kind of manufacture these or uh, some uh, seek some local manufacturer for these. Uh, and, and so that was the diversification. Uh, so that's one form in which it played out. 
now um and and that sort of uh, eventually fell out of favor uh, at least you know even within india after 1991 reforms and so forth but now there has been a resurrection of the argument in a very different kind of form uh, so there is some uh, development research uh, that came through you know so this there's this paper by imps and vexiar uh, and they find that you know that the rising per capita incomes uh, uh, are accompanied by increased diversification within sectors right so if industry grows uh, uh, even if it remains uh, you know a, a constant proportion of the gdp uh, what happens if per capita incomes are rising uh, is that uh, the uh, within industry uh, uh, each product kind of uh, becomes more and more diversified you know different varieties of the product uh, uh, come in so 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 there is uh, new products being discovered uh, which become a part of the part of the industry of, of the basket so some sort of innovation uh, uh, seems to seems to accompany either in process or or uh, in product so what is happened is that you know some some economists uh, most notably i think you know danny rodrick has tried to capitalize on that kind of uh, uh, diversification being a part of rising per capita incomes or is a part of rising growth rates and so he says that you know product diversification itself requires the discovery of new products uh, variants of existing products and processes that allow the available products to be produced at lower cost of production so he says then that these discoveries do not lend themselves to patenting right you know if you could patent them then of course there is no externality problem uh, and this is something we discussed earlier if you recall uh, in the context of the infant yeah. industry argument for protection uh, and so he says well look you know because they can cannot always be patented uh, meaning that there is a danger that they will spill over Uh, and then we'll have that problem that then nobody would invest in the, this uh, this uh, discovery of new products right i mean that's the problem we encountered earlier uh, 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 so so he says there's a free rider problem here uh, other firms can copy them without having to incur any of the costs of discovery so therefore no firm would want to undertake the discovery and that of course then paves the way for government to step into to uh, take some action so uh, so then red rodrick says that look you know the first best policy uh, is a subsidy on investment in new non traditional industries uh, but that requires close monitoring which is not practical so then he goes on and this is something you know i'm, I'm just give, giving you as as a quote really that this is how he he then builds it up says that uh, uh, in houseman and rodrick this was a 2003 paper uh, we recommend generically a carrot and stick strategy since self discovery requires rents to be provided to entrepreneurs one side of the policy has to take the form of a carrot this can be a subsidy of some kind trade protection or the provision of venture capital note that the logic of the problem requires that the rents be provided only to the initial investor nor not to copycats to ensure that mistakes are not perpetuated and bad projects are phased out these rents must in turn be subject either to performance requirements uh, for example a requirement to export or to close monitoring of the use of the uses to which they are put now that's the argument right so what he is saying is that well look you know you can't patent them Uh, uh and uh, so you you have to incentivize these innovations uh and how do i incentivize innovation well then there is a carrot and stick kind of strategy that uh, 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 uh what you need to do is ensure that anybody who makes a discovery gets the rent uh, at least for a while that accrue to it so that can be some sort of subsidy uh, or then he also this could also be trade protection or the venture capital first of all uh if it's venture capital the government doesn't need to intervene i mean venture capital is a phenomenon that uh, should uh, come endogenously yeah uh, so why is that intervention even required really i mean if you allow room for venture capital it will come through uh, if if the market sees that uh, yeah there are uh, some 
uh, entrepreneurs out there uh, who can innovate, right? I mean, that's the whole idea of the startups, uh, et cetera, being financed by venture capitalists. Um, protection, now he's also puts, throws in there, trade protection could be the carrot. And, and, and we saw, uh, if you recall in the context of the infant industry argument, that trade protection really does not solve that problem. Uh, so I don't see how, uh, uh, you know, if it fails in yeah. the infant industry context, then how will it uh, not fail here uh, when it comes to product innovation, right? Uh, uh, any kind of innovation that costs money and then can be free written by somebody else, uh, uh, firms are not going to innovate. They will continue to, to produce the existing products, uh, take advantage of the protection, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 yes, subsidy can, be, can do something. Um, but I come to that issue also in, 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 in a minute. But then he goes on to say about the stick, you know, it says that to ensure the mistakes are not perpetuated and bad projects are phased out, these rents must in turn be subject to some sort of performance requirements, so exporting or close monitoring of the uses to which uh, these things are put. But I mean, look, you know, first he says that, well, uh, the first best policy is subsidy on investment in new non-traditional uh, non industries, but this requires close monitoring, which is not practical. Well, if you can't monitor that, how can you then say simultaneously that you will monitor uh, close monitoring to which you are uh, putting uh, the, the subsidies and so forth? I mean, so it, 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 it's arguing both ways First, saying that, oh, first place cannot be achieved because there's monitoring problem, but then I can do all sorts of other monitoring, yeah. uh, which is the stick part of his argument. So there is an uh, inherent kind of, uh, 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 there's an inherent uh, contradiction. contradiction, right? Contradiction, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So also, you know, going further, uh, there is, uh, 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 even, even leaving these facts aside, uh, uh, there are at least three other problems with his argument, you know, uh, which, well, one I've already noted, which is that uh, trade protection doesn't solve the externality problem. So throwing in trade protection as one of the kind of carrots uh, uh, is uh, uh, patently for, uh, wrong. Uh, uh, and he doesn't elaborate, you know, how will it solve it? And as far as uh, 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 my own analysis is concerned, because in the, the problem arises in the infant industry case also, it, and it is very much the infant industry case. I mean, in a way, this whole diversification business is a sideshow yeah. uh, uh, for, for his argument. Anytime there is an externality, of course, there is a case for intervention. Yeah. So I, I don't see why, you know, he uh, has to bring in all this diversification issue here. Uh, if, if there are products to be innovated, process to, processes to be innovated, regardless of whether or not uh, <laughs> there is a uh, uh, diversification issue, uh, 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 there is a case for intervention. Question is, is there a case for trade intervention? And, and the uh, answer there is, uh, is, 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 is a resounding no. Now, also, the uh, uh, success stories that, you know, Roderick and Hausman, if you go back the, the work that he uh, uh, refers to, uh, uh, to bolster the argument, uh, these are uh, cut flowers in Colombia, soccer balls in Pakistan, and hats in Bangladesh. <laughs> the reality is that none of these were actually successes made by the government. These yeah. were all market uh, successes, you know, the governments may, can come in later on after they have actually succeeded. Uh, I mean, it really reminds me of um, something that uh, uh, my friend, you know, the, the uh, famous uh, Japanese economist Tatsuo Hata used to tell me, we were together at the World Bank at the time, uh, and uh, he used to say that, you know, in Japan, <laughs> the Miti, uh, the, the Ministry of Industry and Trade, uh, uh, in those days, in the, in the 60s and so forth, they, they would simply see what sectors are succeeding and then they, they'll give them the subsidy. So it'll look like they were creating that miracle, but, you know, this was happening anyway. <laughs> And, and so, you know, this is a very similar story here, cut flowers in Colombia, soccer balls in Pakistan and heads in Bangladesh. These are not successes created actually by the government, you know. So, so these, these uh, happened uh, um, uh, much more kind of uh, uh, generically in, 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 in the countries themselves. Uh, you just said that every externality may need some intervention, but it does not right. need trade intervention. Right, right. But I would actually go one step further and say every externality doesn't necessarily merit an intervention. There are some externalities which are inframarginal, right? Uh, they don't affect uh, the uh, 
uh, optimal production or allocation of the good in question. Sometimes externalities get resolved uh, through vertical integration, you know, uh, the uh, kinds of arguments that Demsets has made, right? Sometimes there's a Cosian solution uh, to externalities, uh, especially in innovation markets, uh, if there are tradable property rights. The inframarginal externality, of course, Buchanan and Stubblebein have have laid that out. So every time people see externality and therefore it needs to have a Pigouvian resolution, which now spills over as trade protectionism and interacts with the other side of, you know, international political economy. It's not so clear to me that the argument is convincing. I, I think the standard has to be higher. Absolutely. In fact, now you could actually go even yet another step and, and argue that uh, uh, to, to think that uh, uh, the governments in these countries are capable enough yeah. to actually pinpoint the externalities and actually yeah. implement the solutions, uh, uh, e- even very simple solutions, and to yeah. think that this will not create uh, 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 perverse incentives on the part yeah. of the lobbyists yeah. uh, is, is to assume a lot. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, in, in, you know, in the, the governments have actually, uh, you know, um, created often more problems in trying to supposedly trying to correct the externalities yeah. uh, than they have solved. Yeah. Uh, and and um, uh, I, I remember, you know, uh, my uh, 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 both my friend and mentor, Larry Westfall, who was yes. one of the very early, you know, economists to study South Korea. Uh, when he ultimately, you know, eventually wrote a kind of uh, more retrospective piece in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Uh, He noted, you know, he was a very wise man, you know, he believed in, uh, I mean, uh, Larry does believe in, and certainly in that, in those days, I don't know his current thinking, but uh, he certainly at the time believed in the infant industry protection and all. Uh, But he was very careful to say that, look, you know, uh, uh, this requires a very, very capable government. Yeah, uh, and uh, 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 that is not the case in most developing countries. So it's only in very rare cases, uh, such as those of South Korea and Taiwan, that you had capable governments, you know, to draw lessons from their experience, and you think that you can replicate in the, uh, many of the African countries or even in South Asia, uh, yeah. is to is to assume uh, uh, a lot. And, you know, even when you have capable governments, there is a question of what is one's model of innovation? Right. Uh, And is it a process of trial and error and a sort of bottom up feedback mechanism through which innovation arises? This is through consumer feedback. This is because of competition, uh, you know, other margins through which the innovation is being propelled. Or is the innovation a result of a small group of experts uh, and their ability to identify winners and losers? Right. So very often they conflate venture capitalists with governments. Right. <laughs> venture capitalists are a small group of elite people who have the ability to pick winners and losers, but they're also the residual claimants uh, of their choices. That model can't automatically be superimposed on the government. And now we say there's an externality. So we're willing to let go of the bottom-up trial and error process of innovation. And now the government can pick winners and losers as well as a venture capitalist or someone else can. And I think that's another really big conflation, but that's a conflation of frameworks you know, it's it's not about a particular case or a particular country. It's more of a, a sort of like a mental model of how one thinks innovation takes place in an economy. True, true. And 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 on that, you know, we have very little limited understanding. Uh, so, and and generally, what seems to work is you know broader kind of policy on this. You know, uh, the, the the kind of model that the United States has pursued generally. You know that. Uh, uh, very good higher education, incentivizing research at the universities, and uh, uh, then sort of interactions between the universities and the industry. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, that seems to work a lot better uh, than than any specific kind of intervention that you do uh, uh, by incentivizing specific entrepreneurs and so forth. You know, 
Yeah, I mean, you can sometimes pick up certain areas where R and D is required. I mean, three D uh, printing kind of things or something, you know. But but you know, even there, actually, successes uh, when when you pinpoint these things, uh, it's uh, are much harder. The broader kind of framework, if you take, so you you get better successes. Yeah, and you know, uh, at at the end of the day, the the few frictions for factors of production to uh get together in different combinations the greater innovation one will get in the economy right so even broader principles like free movement of goods free movement of people free movement of capital these are the big important sort of you know at, at the framework level these are the necessary ingredients so that then you can launch a thousand combinations of different things and some kind of innovation takes place yes uh but this kind of pinpointed intervention here and there to solve one externality that problem you know diversification capital market imperfection it actually uh it's it's a it undermines the larger framework which will allow more combinations right yes. it's increasing frictions in the yes. economy so Often. in one sense this kind of intervention if you think if you take a very big picture view of growth and innovation something like what paul romer talks about in you know the endogenous uh, growth theories uh this is actually a problem for innovation yes. no, uh, in the larger scheme of things yeah no it's what you're saying it reminds me of you know the story that shanta devarajan used to <laughs> tell us you know very early in the very early days you know these are the days the laptops are just beginning to come in in the united states uh, and uh, so he traveled to south korea and uh, the the custom guys sort of stopped him and start, uh, uh, then they just opened the laptop started taking pictures and everything you know so he thought what was wrong you know <laughs> so apparently later he understood that <laughs> this was a new product yeah. and they <laughs> had no idea <laughs> and so well so therefore they 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 wanted to you know some sort of reverse engineering or something yes. you know there there's some interest because of that what i'm Absolutely. sort of uh, 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 hinting towards is that uh, trade if it moves freely you know diversity uh, there's a lot of diffusion of technology through trade right yeah. because uh, uh technology is is, is uh, embodied in the machines uh, uh, there are products also uh, which uh, have technology which you can then reverse engineer you know if trade is happening but i mean i remember look you know in india we were not even allowing these imports to happen so the, the innovators or entrepreneurs had never even had a chance to see the product and then to re- reverse engineer <laughs> it was on the other hand you know things like medicines did move and those got reverse engineered yeah. because of the very weak patent law yeah. and so a fantastic uh, generic industry emerged yeah uh, uh, so so it was not so much you know a, any specific intervention that the government had done but simply a law which allowed you to uh, sort of uh, uh, copy uh, the patented medicines in those days uh, that create the generics but it was through trade that the first medicines would come in right you know so <laughs> this happens even at a personal level right like because i have traveled and i have lived outside india and i've lived in new york city and washington dc dc which are sort of you know food capitals uh, uh, within the united states i am now more likely to cook italian food or korean food or thai food at home uh because i have tasted it in a restaurant i know what it tastes like i have been to stores where i can get the ingredients my grandmother who never set foot outside the country and nor did she eat at restaurants uh was a fantastic cook but she has never made you know a spaghetti <laughs> or true. she has never yeah, made yeah, yeah. kimchi or anything so yeah. even at a personal level we experience this on a daily basis but we sort of forget about it when we think about it in economic models or anything else the yeah. idea that exposure and diffusion of uh you know trade and te- uh, diffusion of ideas and technology takes place when there's free movement of goods and people that's yeah. sort of like the most basic insight that each one of us has right right no absolutely absolutely i think those are all fantastic examples and and food one is great actually because 
you know, uh, uh, I'm uh, 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 slightly, uh, I'm a generation slightly before yours. And so my mother on traditional Mewadi food was uh, absolutely fantastic cook. Yeah. But even if it was, you know, Punjabi, Bengali or any other food, she was, you know, <laughs> because that was a generation that uh, yeah. didn't sort of, you know, travel very much and uh, all, you know. So even within India, the, 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 uh, because the, uh, of the lack of movement uh, or very restricted movement, um, people didn't know. So yeah. you know the the uh, but but within uh, uh, our lifetimes you know those uh, uh, barriers have broken because of uh, uh, the movement of people and and uh, and um, information and so forth. So that's one of the reasons I want to go through the yeah. you know nuts and bolts of these arguments. Yeah. Uh, now moving on to the next one is the question of capital market imperfections, and. This is basically the argument that interventions uh, through protective tariffs, right, or subsidies uh, or some kinds of benefits to domestic producers, they're justified in order to correct the distortions in the capital market, right? So if there were absolutely perfect and free and open capital markets, we wouldn't need this. But given the imperfection of capital markets, we need to solve that distortion with an additional intervention, in this case, protectionism. Uh, can you walk us through this argument? And to my knowledge, virtually no economy has perfect capital markets, uh, but many economies have high degrees of free trade. Uh, so also some sense of how different countries solve the problem of imperfect capital markets without protectionism. Good, good, good way to phrase it. Um, so let's start, you know, first of all, uh, I, I want to go back to the infinity argument, right? You remember that one of the things we said there is that um, uh, if learning really is internal and the, and the industry is socially desirable, uh, then the market will ensure that it will happen. And, and the way it will happen is that I, 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 I incur losses today but my profits tomorrow more than offset the losses. Yeah. So I can cover my losses by borrowing from the banks. Go, I go to the capital markets, borrow to cover my losses today. And tomorrow when I make profits that more than offset today's losses, I can pay back the loan uh, to the creditors. Uh, and that's how it works. Now, so first of all, the capital market imperfections argument is, uh, is, is resurrected, I mean, it, it's sort of brought in uh, right in the context of trying to resurrect the infant industry argument. Yeah. So oh, but, you know, the capital markets may be imperfect. And so uh, uh, the bankers might not see it correctly. They might think that, you know, you're, there is no learning or you, tomorrow your cost will not fall enough, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and therefore, there is an argument uh, for infant industry protection. Yeah. Right? So, uh, so uh, first, that clarification uh, uh, is, is, is essential as a starting point. Um, it's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, th there is not an uh, imperfection in capital markets is not a separate, in, uh, is, is not an argument for infant industry protection because the capital, even if there is no learning involved, if capital markets are imperfect, are imperfect, then the problem can arise almost anywhere. So anything that, let's say, requires a, a, a heavy investment, a very capital intensive industry, and has a long gestation period. So, you know, you will make investment, it will take three years before output begins to happen. Well, for three years, no output is going to happen. For three years, I'm going to make losses even though there is no learning involved here. It's, it's yeah. simply the fact that, you know, it takes that long to set up the entire factory. Yeah. Uh, it's, so it's not a learning issue at all. Uh, so the capital market imperfection issue is, is quite independent of infant industry. One should not conflate infant industry yeah. argument with capital market imperfections. So yeah. what we assumed there when we discussed the infant industry argument saying that you can go and borrow from the capital markets is just the right way to approach the infant industry argument, yeah. uh, you know. So now come to the uh, capital market imperfections it's themselves, right? Now, uh, 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 certainly, I mean, if, if 
uh, you know, in trade, in international trade, there is a good body of, uh, there is a, quite a body of literature where uh, 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 this is cited as, as, as a possible argument for protection. And, and in principle, uh, if, if uh, uh, somehow uh, the, the, um, the, the mark, I mean, if somehow the bankers are kind of underestimating the return to industry, right? Then when anybody wants to go, goes to borrow from, from, uh, from the uh, uh, bankers, they, they would underlend to the industry and, and uh, that, that would, uh, uh, um, you know, leave the industrial production suboptimal. Yeah. Um, now, forget even that. Actually, it is even uh, for for any other reason. Let's say, right? If for if for any other reason, uh, uh, the the industrial output happens to be below optimal. There may be other for other market failures and so forth, right? I mean, even then, you could say that look, you know, the first best will be to subsidize uh, uh, the output itself. Yeah. Uh, but as a second best, you could subsidize capital. Yeah. And and that is how a lot of the trade literature kind of uh, uh, made the argument uh, uh, the, that, you know, the, the uh, 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 first best intervention is credit subsidy to the extent of underestimation. I mean, you know, so, so even if we actually locate the, the, the distortion in the capital markets, then of course the first best thing is some sort of credit subsidy. Uh, the second best intervention would be a production subsidy in this. So I'm sort of reverse depending on where the the distortion distortion is on the production side yeah. so that the industrial output is, is suboptimal then you subsidize output uh, but as a second best you can subsidize capital uh, uh, in industry like use of uh, use of capital in industry if on the contrary the di distortion is directly in the in the capital markets then the first best is really it's capital market subsidy is what we would say uh, and the, the subsidy on output is the second best way to solve it. Now, the problem is this, okay? I mean, so, so in principle, let me grant it that, you know, conceptually you can make that argument. But what is the, you know, when it comes to practicing that kind of argument, what is yeah. the problem? The first one was, you know, very nicely pointed out by, by uh, Ann Kruger. So she said, look, you know, this is... Uh, 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 again, you're thinking in terms of this two product model, one is agriculture, the other is industry. Yeah. And somehow the market, you know, what I need, you know, somehow this, within this framework, because I see that uh, because of this whole export pessimism that at other times we have talked about, right, that the, yeah. if I rely on agricultural exports, uh, it's a non-starter for me uh, at, uh, because uh, at, at, at demand is relatively inelastic. Uh, uh, both price and price, so so demand is subject to low price price elasticity as well as low income elasticity. Yeah. So, in any case, because of low income elasticity, as industrial economies become richer, demand will continuously shift in favor of manufacturers and against primary products, and therefore my terms of trade as the exporter of primary products uh, will continue to deteriorate. Yeah. So it's not a winning strategy. Likewise, even if I increase productivity in my primary products and want to export more, then my own exports will lead to a massive decline in the price because the demand is also price, uh, demand for agricultural and primary products is also price inelastic. And the price inelasticity would mean my attempts to sell more will result in a massive decline in price and therefore fall in the revenues that I am able to get. Yeah. So it's primary products are non-starter. Uh, I got to work on industry. And so how do I do, do, do the industry, right? So, so I find some ways, you know, so we can have capital. Uh, and, and, and you might say that that reason industry is suboptimal is that my capital markets are not working and the, so industry is not be getting fair share of uh, uh, credit. Uh, so let's, you know, subsidize uh, uh, the uh, industry. Now, just recast the problem in three goods. Where you got two industrial goods. One is an export good and one is an import good. Now, if you start subsidizing uh, 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 the, the, the import good, uh, capital, use of capital in the import good, it's entirely possible that your comparative advantage was actually there in the export good and that was the underproduced good. Yeah. 
but but once you do this you will actually pull capital out of export good into the import good or import competing good that will be the wrong thing to do because uh, uh, by assumption i'm saying well you know my, my underproduced good may have been actually the export good yeah uh, so so it's not so straightforward but the biggest problem i think in, in my view on on this capital market uh, 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 intervention kind of thing was was pointed out by ronald mckenna and and very rightly so you know he was uh, uh, he came from the finance angle right you know he was an expert on financial markets very early, one of the very early experts in the, on on that subject so mckenna's point was that look when you are in a developing country this kind of sectoral intervention i mean in the end this is sectoral intervention that you uh, work for an, even if uh, you are trying to work let's say on the export sector uh, and and want to want to say that well not enough capital is going to the export sector you are talking about subsidizing capital uh, the use of capital in the entire export sector but he is saying that look the developing country problems are actually very different uh, you cannot go with these kinds of subsidies at the entire sector level what happens is that every sector whether it is agriculture including he said even agriculture but other industries even services they all have because these are very fragmented they all have entrepreneurs with very high returns and entrepreneurs with very very low productivity and and so they are not you know your, your high return activities are not uh, uh, like concentrated in a particular sector so that you could yeah. you could give the subsidy to the sector yeah you you really have these high and low productivity activities going on simultaneously in the same sector yeah and and so really there is no easy shortcut actually uh, uh, to developing the financial markets he says look you know ultimately this is all about development of the financial markets and and work on that otherwise you are going to make mistake because if you say i'm going to you know give capital to industry as a whole right then and by the way good example of, of all this is is there in in the indian context which is the uh, the the um, priority sector lending yes right which we, is we are, terrible <laughs> what are we doing we are we are doing exactly what Mac, uh, what ron mckinnon says that look you know the, the msmes are not getting enough agriculture is not getting enough exporters are not getting enough farmers are not getting enough so allocate a significant part of your uh, credit to these sectors <laughs> but each of these sectors as you know <laughs> high return producers and low return producers yeah. and those actually who are low priority right you know you're saying so these are priority sectors there are non priority sectors but many non priority sectors actually do have a lot of very high productivity entrepreneurs yeah so your job is actually to to really find these Uh, you know identify the high uh, return entrepreneurs or high return activities uh, which are spread throughout the economy and give credit to them and that requires development of the financial markets and if yeah. you think that you know you, you can really solve the problem by giving credit at the sectoral level um then uh, that's what you would think and not develop your financial markets properly Yeah. and that has happened in india right i mean and it's that... a giant rent seeking exercise yeah. I mean, with look, additional know. problems right you give yeah. loans to priority sectors and candidates that are low productivity and because of political bargains and you know political connections and before you know it you have massive npas and you have a banking crisis that is on the brink you know because right. of this kind yeah. of priority sector lending right. well certainly there's a contributor there is yeah. also this reckless lending that happened Absolutely. in the contract. so i don't know pin the entire problem to to of npas on on the priority sector lending but it certainly has contributed right it certainly has contributed uh, and even if it doesn't contribute even if things are normal and all and banks are able to kind of cross subsidize and and, and manage the point is that you know you you are neglecting certain very high 
Absolutely. Productivity activities, because you have to allocate a part of the uh, uh, credit, uh, a yeah. significant part of the credit to these priority sector uh, lending activities. And you don't even know, right? I mean, uh, at what level do you want to maintain MSME sectors? That should be an endogenous matter. Uh, you, you don't want to kind of, you know, through uh, uh, artificial credit subsidies, uh, uh, keep alive small little firms. I mean, <laughs> India's big problem is actually, you know, these very small enterprises. Uh, and, and if you then also try to reinforce that through the credit subsidies and all, uh, then uh, you are only perpetuating a, a structure which is the wrong structure. It also, industrial structure itself actually becomes hostage to the, the that kind of lending, right? Because, you know, if you say that these are my priority sectors with no clear, I mean, with no yeah. clear uh, 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 justification why these are the priority sectors, yeah. uh, then you are perpetuating a particular structure uh, of the economy. Yeah. And, and the whole development process is about actually, you know, the structural change. Uh, right. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you want uh, uh, the share of agriculture, particularly in employment, to fall and share of industry and services to rise. And, yeah. and so, so that, and this know, does the opposite. Right. Yeah. It keeps that it perpetuated. Uh, it's perpetuated. Absolutely. It's perpetuated. No, there's an additional uh, pattern I am observing now that you're walking us through multiple arguments. It seems to me like the problem is usually not a trade related problem right? They are using trade interventions and protectionism to always solve a problem which is somewhere else in the economy, and they're not able to solve it. Uh, or it's a much harder fix, right? It's much easier to enact a credit subsidy for this sector or that exporter, as opposed to the decades it takes to have financial sector penetration ease, you know, sort of frictionless uh, or very low friction lending, good identification, that kind of infrastructure takes a really long time to build. And so all the models basically assume that that can't be done and try to put a bandaid on it using a trade protectionism model when actually the problem has nothing to do with trade. That's what it seems to me like. Is that an ungenerous interpretation of all the models you're walking us through? Yeah, well, I, I mean, a lot of truth to that, a lot of truth to that, that, you know, it's an easy fix because, you know, even because even subsidy, which would do less harm, yeah, meaning production subsidy, which certainly will do less harm than uh, uh, trade protection because trade protection uh, 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 is, is a combination of output subsidy and consumption tax. So, so protection is not only kind of giving subsidy to the production, but it's also taxing the consumer of yeah. the product which is subject to the tariff. Uh, uh, so it's worse. Uh, uh, but, but you know, uh, it, uh, 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 even so, so it will do less harm to do output subsidy. But output subsidy is hard to maintain because politically it is. It, uh, people see through it that you know yeah. you're taking out of my pocket and giving it to somebody else. Yeah. But trade protection is very easy. Because you think that you are imposing it on the foreigners. Yeah. Nobody sees that my own consumers actually are paying most of this tariff revenue that you are collecting. Yeah. Uh, you, you just give the impression that it is the foreigners. We are collecting it from them. Yeah. So they are the target. So politically, it's, they are very easy target actually. You know, uh, uh, and and the, the thing about trade taxes or tariffs is that they generate revenues. Yeah. So the uh, finance ministry generally is very happy that you know I'm getting these revenues. Yeah, uh, and and so they see this as a good fix. But the bigger damage that happens, of course, Ruthie, is that uh, uh, in the end that delays your development of the financial markets. Yeah. You see, if you take the view that oh, you know, financial markets will always remain imperfect, and therefore I have to solve these problems through these alternative uh, yeah. measures, you are delaying the development of the financial markets. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, uh, uh, fair enough that you know financial markets will maybe even in America or Europe they are imperfect. But they are far, far less imperfect. You know, they deliver a hell of a lot of better outcomes than in most other countries, ultimately the financial markets. Uh, and, and so there is an argument that, look, you know, don't delay your uh, development of the financial markets by substituting all these other uh, interventions, uh, uh, and especially the trade intervention, which really is ultimately not fixing the problem at all. 
it's neither fixing the problem and at the same time it is delaying the development of your financial markets yeah. no you know to take an example which has nothing to do with foreign trade or financial markets but will illustrate the point uh, you know think about farmers in india for a very long time a very big problem with farmers is that their markets are very local and because we don't have good cold storage good infrastructure large agricultural markets access you know transportation infrastructure access to large agricultural markets uh, farmers don't get a great price for their produce right they get very low price and therefore they need all kinds of subsidies we need to give them you know free electricity we need to give them fertilizers we need to give them all these other you know loan subsidies or loan waivers were still but what really needs to happen for the farmer is you need to build the roads you need to build the infrastructure for the agricultural market you need to build the dispute resolution system you need to create a proper system so that you know spot contracts and futures contracts can actually be enforced those are the things that are going to improve the prices that you know farmers get but it's very difficult to build roads it's difficult to bring in a new dispute resolution system or create a large marketplace so what we instead do is you know we give them loan waivers or you know subsidized fertilizer or free electricity or msp or something like that but what they really need is the road right in fact there's some great literature showing that the moment there is increase in road penetration right and railway penetration basically access to transport agricultural productivity starts increasing and this is an age old insight we see good evidence for this in india but to me the trade uh you know uh, intervention argument because of imperfect capital markets though that's a completely different part of the economy it seems very similar to this kind of logic right except now we're talking about foreigners so it's really a matter of infrastructure development on this my question is how do countries that have open and free trade how do they deal with imperfect capital markets they must also have this problem to some extent right yeah but look you know certainly in uh, 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 the the in in the advanced countries still the capital markets are are much better developed and and so at least uh, but something I, like I, korea i mean yeah. you know this was not an advanced country when it opened up its trade yeah it must have had not perfect financial sector and capital markets so how did a country like korea deal with this problem uh without protectionism i guess that's my question like is there a way or a or a model or examples of developing countries that might have dealt with this so there were certainly some credit subsidies in 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 korea um, uh, but but that i don't think was the was the dominant instrument which you know so so some interventions happened and this is where you know this is a whole business on targeting and industrial uh, targeting yeah. uh, uh, etc comes in but but that's not the dominant story you know at, at the end of the day the, the to me it seems the korean story is really very much you know uh, um, taking advantage of the global markets uh, um, with the, uh, very early on by the way you know in 1960 onwards because korea really you know devalued big time the domestic currency uh, which very quickly kind of generated response of the manufacturing exports uh you know 1960s to 1964 manufacturing exports are expanding at the rate of something like 50 60% a year wow. uh, it's a very slow base i mean i admit it is coming from a very low base so it, yeah. it looks a little exaggerated but but the point is that that the structure of the uh, exports dramatically changes from uh, agricultural to manufacturers Uh, you know uh, uh, manufacturers initially being to some 20 30% in 1960 by 1964 they are easily they have crossed more than 50 uh, more than half of the exports become manufacturers so that i think convinced uh, the the leadership that uh, you know this this export business could uh, could deliver yeah uh, and so by 1965 uh, 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 park chung he was very much onto the ball game on this you know so, uh, 
and so he, he very much started uh, having monthly meetings or, or bi-monthly once in two months or something you know he'll meet all the export interests uh, uh, figure out what the bottlenecks are and it was relatively you know that korea is number one small but at that time income levels being what they were economically it was even smaller so it was not very hard to find out who are the big exporters and they didn't have the small scale industry business so you know the exporters usually are larger it's a larger firms which export so it was easy to kind of collect in the and and find out from them you know what the bottlenecks were and all so so that is how i understand the korean story uh, and exactly whether they tried to i mean certain credit subsidies existed as i said uh, but i don't think that was a big part of the story uh, so uh, but their also, side of the story is they are growing their uh engagement with the global economy and simultaneously strengthening their financial sector exactly. that's the story so, so this happens yeah yeah you know they didn't scuttle it by the, you know nationalizing the the banking sector for yeah. example you know so uh but also the, you know there is capability of government uh, issue uh, yeah. uh, these were you know uh, uh, capable governments uh, 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 consulting the experts and all uh, uh, as well alongside uh but but largely you know making good common sensical decisions um uh in the china story you know where there is much more presence of the public sector uh is is similar one at least in the sense of you know capability i mean deng xiaoping really was a capable uh, uh leader uh so again this leadership issue of course does play a very critical role at least in my thinking it does so basically the state also making a credible commitment that they'll pursue free trade and focus on removing infrastructural bottlenecks as opposed to pandering to you know uh, specific interest groups and lobbies and things like that definitely definitely i think so you know i mean that seems to be a part of the the story somewhere right, right. because and, and, it's quite you know, easy to give in to the interests of exporters not all exporters ask for better capital markets usually they just ask for a very specific subsidy for their right. particular good so Either i that find or- that quite fascinating yeah no either that would also but you know alongside for them the uh, the ability to import the inputs is very important yeah uh, i mean those are the bottlenecks yes. i think you know that that uh, uh, park chung hee uh, the president of korea in those days tried to uh, 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 remove uh, you know uh, the, that yeah. uh, are they getting their inputs in time are they getting these duty free Uh, yeah. and, and they you know even though they had tariffs uh, uh, they want they did ensure that the exporters really didn't have to pay the, those tariffs or were reimbursed rather quickly yeah. and often they would actually reimburse them a bit more than what they they paid yeah. uh, so so there may have been some sort of element of subsidy but uh, uh, since they also had some import protection you know th- that small subsidy was only neutralization of of what what of the import tariffs that existed in the first place so so that's how you know and and they then let the financial sector financial markets uh, evolve uh, and and develop on, uh, alongside but in india what we have done is to you know nationalize the banks, banks and yeah. uh, and so that is really i mean you know innovation has been very limited yeah. uh, much of innovation only began happening after 91 when we yeah. began to allow uh, private banks again in a big yeah. way uh, we allowed and foreign pop- collaborations foreign, yeah foreign banks to come in as well uh so so that's when some innovation began and then of course information technology it came through also but even then you can see that you know the private banks are way ahead yeah. uh, of the public sector banks so yeah and you know we are treating public sector banks like any other public sector enterprise as basically a jobs program for the middle class that is formal yeah, and unionized yeah, yeah. you know that's what the indian government banking sector has become it's become yeah. a jobs program for right, the elite right, right. as opposed to its actual job yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is to you know right. make a uh, uh, greater financial resources and penetration right. available right. Right. so right. this is i think uh, one of the original sins of uh, indian socialism and of course mrs gandhi you know right. nationalizing banks in a really right. big way right. in 69 right right and and also you see the problem is that uh, the the leadership of the public sector banks is always under the fear of vigilance yeah so 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 the, they that, never that, innovate yeah they will never innovate exactly yeah. you know so so it, it it impedes the innovation yeah so you don't get 
promoted and get big bonuses for the good bets you yeah. make yeah. and you get pulled up and punished and taken to the CVC and CBI for even one bad bet right. Right. and uh, 0% bad loans or error is bad for any bank yeah. right it's it means Absolutely. it's not Absolutely. making appropriate number of bets uh, but now we are on the other side we just have very yeah. very high number of non performing uh assets so but your point is well taken that this is not uh the the capital markets and financial a weak financial sector uh it's not clear that the obvious solution is protectionism it right. could be some other intervention or state capacity development in those areas but a protectionist approach is clearly not the not the way forward right. um, i mean what the big thing you need is is uh, uh, the expertise to evaluate projects yeah. you know the bankers have to have the ability to evaluate the projects properly yeah. uh, that's what you need because ultimately you want to invest in high productivity projects yeah. and if you don't have that ability then uh, uh, or uh, uh, otherwise you impede that ability even if you have the ability and the decisions are political yeah. uh, uh, through through this uh, crony kind of lending but uh, arvin then, that's then also endogenous to the ownership right yeah. Yeah, it the is the ability to so. pick good yeah, yeah. projects. Yeah, no, that comes out right in our case. It comes out very clearly because yeah. uh, private sector banks uh, don't have that kind of NPA problem. Yeah. They did not take a rupee of the taxpayer money to clean up their NPAs. They did yeah. their own clean up. Yeah. Uh, 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 whereas in the public sector, you know, NPAs have been massive, and they had to be cleaned up uh, 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 through taxpayer money. Yeah, and so, you know when all the big scams like. you know vijay malya and nirav modi and these sorts of things happen i don't remember which private sector bank it was i think it was hdfc and they were asked you know did they approach you for a loan and they said yes and we offered them a cup of tea and said thank you <laughs> and that's basically it so it's not like there's uh, an additional you know some kind of special superpower that the private uh banks have which the public sector employees don't have you put the same employees in a different bank and they will perform just so much better you know in picking winners and losers so i think the ownership is <laughs> what is very driving much, very very much so very much so yeah i mean you know absolutely uh, um i mean it's not that you know these scandals don't happen in 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 private sector banks you know we did have some yeah. bit of in icici and all but you see the uh, far less the far scale is very fewer different. bad loans the scale is the scale is uh, i mean ultimately look it goes back to the commercial pressure uh, yeah. you know the the private banks have the commercial pressure and public sector yeah. banks don't yeah they're fully uh, subsidized I mean, basically yeah. I mean, I mean that's a, that's a one big big factor, of course. But then there are also these other issues of constraints, of yeah. vigilance, kind of things, you know, which uh, yeah. which constrain the ability of the leadership. Even good leadership really can go only so far in these banks because of yeah. the vigilance problems. No, and also you know, uh, a lot of the fiscal spending is now done. through the banking system this is of course viral acharya urjit patel they've talked about how you know very high uh, fiscal spending and what they call the theory of fiscal dominance is now entering the banking sector creating these spillover problems and entering monetary policy so that's one side uh, but the other is also just plain simple political pressure right uh, yeah. this is to some extent uh, missing or reduced in private banks you don't have political leaders putting pressure on bureaucrats or the boards of you know punjab national bank or sbi or something like that and saying that you need to give so and so a loan for this project and typically it's because that person lent them money for the election campaign or you know some other quid pro quo that has taken place on some other side you know of the economy so you just see less of this so it's not to say that the private banks are perfect and they can completely develop the financial capacity of a nation like india with no uh, uh, other inputs necessary it's just that we have a massive public sector system which is just failed to deliver right right, right. absolutely so absolutely. to go back to the 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 arguments for protectionism uh one argument this was 
you know it would keep coming up for developing countries again and again i mean it's started with the asian countries today people are saying the same thing about many african countries this idea that open trade uh is bad for employment domestically right uh this is again an argument that doesn't go away in india of course we have a particular kind of demographic structure and we have had what many people have called jobless growth right we haven't seen that you know sort of massive employment in manufacturing that you saw in taiwan or korea or china and other places like that so this argument has come back in a new way you know in in this century um uh, it was sort of slightly differently packaged in the previous century what is the relationship between free trade and unemployment especially domestic employment or unemployment and is there any merit that protectionism will re- will increase employment within the country this is a, there is not a whole lot to say on this one because uh, i i think the evidence is very clear uh, if you are talking of aggregate employment uh, show me any country you know if there is a relationship between protection and aggregate employment uh, uh, uh surely if you're talking about any sectoral employment yeah then of course you know you give protection to auto industry and you'll get higher employment in auto industry yeah. uh, um, but uh, uh, what about the jobs in the rest of the economy right so Uh, 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 evidence uh, really doesn't uh, there is as no evidence actually that the trade policy has a, a, an impact on the ag- aggregate uh, employment uh, ultimately which is what you know employment is about yeah. now india is itself is a good example uh, 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 you 1990 91 starting with you know massively opened up the economy in fact trade also expanded we know it Yeah. Uh, uh, quite dramatically, right? You know, exports were seven percent, went up to twenty yeah. percent. Imports were about ten percent, uh, went up to some thirty uh, yeah. percent of the GDP. Uh, uh, and during this period, our own employment and employment surveys actually show uh, uh, hardly any impact. Uh, you know, the the uh, the unemployment uh, rates, uh, whether you look at you know, there are two or three different criteria that get used. Uh, uh, um, by any criterion it doesn't shift much at all i mean it's only uh, the plfs uh, produced a slightly higher unemployment rate which should be discussed and all but during that period if anything we had increased protection not reduced protection during this period so if one were to draw at least some basic correlation there is it's, it's the opposite the correlation is moving the opposite direction i mean i don't want to draw that because i don't think that a uh, number uh, that that you know rise from about 2 3% to 6% had anything to do with trade policy i don't think so uh, 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 in fact if you look at some of the other countries south korea taiwan uh, china successful countries quite the contrary what you see is massive uh, employment opportunities created by I this agree. expansion of trade uh and so therefore uh, the industry and services are drawing workers out of agriculture in a big way uh and uh, the, uh, uh, in the face of very very rapidly rising real wages yeah. uh, in korea in the you know 1965 onwards uh, you see these wages are rising at the rate of some 9 to 10% a year uh through the 1980s you know uh, uh, every one of these decades you know you see this uh, 9 to 10% growth in the real wages uh and at the same time it is absorbing very large volume of workforce right so clearly you know that the that, uh, that, that it's it's a labor scarce economy that, uh, uh, i mean it's turning into labor scarce economy which is why the real wages are rising i mean it's not you know korean case is not like arthur lewis type of uh, disguised unemployment model even you know yeah. <laughs> the uh, the workers have to be paid higher and higher wages actually yeah. as they are being uh, uh, drawn out of agriculture so evidence simply you know on the aggregate is 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 simply not supportive now in fact if we then go back and see indian problem which is the problem of underemployment i have always said yeah. this Uh, uh, underemployment in agriculture and underemployment in industry and services meaning that you know uh, 
two workers or three workers are doing a job which can be easily done by one worker. Uh, so, uh, and, and that of course means that uh, output per worker is incredibly low, yeah. low productivity employment that's underemployment. And there actually the uh, tra- trade will help it you will help. To go the other way. I mean, it will reduce this underemployment and raise the productivity. So I think that, uh, it, it, politically, it's good, you know, easy to make that kind of argument. Perhaps you know, uh, everybody who is looking for a job it identifies with it, uh, but it really doesn't have anything to do with. Uh, I mean, uh, if they, if that were the case, right? If protection, I mean, even more stark. I mean, truly stark example is our days of fifties, uh, sixties, and seventies. Closed when economy. Pro- <laughs> when when we were completely closed economy. And look how many jobs we created. Hardly yeah. any jobs got created, right? I mean, for my generation, you know, uh, uh, all, all the even movies that would come out were all about, about the these, Bezrozgar, Naujavan. Yeah, yeah, these young men, you know, seeking jobs and all. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, and you know, that, that uh, often uh, uh, for any single job, la- large number of people arriving and then the hero yeah. kind of making the sacrifice that, you know, oh, well, you know, that may job li leta to tum be rozgar reh jate and all, you know, so the yeah. hero, <laughs> let's go of the opportunity. So, so you know, it's just, um, uh, and it progressively, in fact, in the clerical jobs, you know, uh, 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 there was a generation when uh, 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 high school was enough, you know, yeah. for clerical jobs. Then bachelor's degree and then master's degree became yeah. uh, the, the norm. Uh, yeah, now you and have now, PhDs now, applying for like, you know, there's exactly. a pure job in the railways exactly. and two lakh people exactly. apply that's, and things and like that's that. A, that's a reflection of, you know, it's still uh, very limited jobs that we have created in industry, private sector. Yeah. So, you know, the uh, the best jobs are, you know, you get 18,000 rupees per year. Uh, 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 job guarantee for life pension assured uh, you've got health benefits assured uh, in a few years you also get housing uh, uh, you know in the private sector a lecturer will probably get just 18000 rupees with no job security no uh, health benefits uh, uh, yeah. covered uh, um, uh, uh, no housing nothing you know and you will have to work very very hard yeah whereas you know as a, as a, as a class 4 employee in the government of india uh, the so-called multitasking staff. Yeah, <laughs> really. Half, half the time they're totally free. Uh, not not very much to do. So you know, here I understand the argument in the aggregate, right? So we understand that free trade will basically increase the size of the pie, right? So as yeah. the economy grows, there will be more jobs and so on. Now I want to dig in a little bit into the sectoral question, and this has proven true more for developed countries than developing countries like India. So you have developed countries where you had like large manufacturing, uh, you know, with as free trade opened up places like China and Taiwan, Bangladesh, they started uh, developing a comparative advantage in those sectors. Those uh, industries, factories went to those countries and therefore the jobs went to those countries. So you had some sectoral churn, right? So if 50 years ago you were working in a shoe factory in the United States, for instance, today that job simply doesn't exist. And now the question in developed countries is not so much protectionism, but how do we make sure that people who are employed in one sector where they are no longer as productive can be reintegrated into the rest of the economy in some other sector, right? Uh, This is also related to arguments about automation, you know, all the, the technology, artificial intelligence, all these new sorts of things which are coming in and taking away traditional jobs. But Trade is a very large part of the argument, you know, against this kind of sectoral mass unemployment in the short term, which really devastates families, cities, regions, and so on. Uh, What is your view on this kind of very specific sectoral unemployment and free trade? Yeah, I mean, here, so, so in the developed country context, actually, you know, even at the aggregate level, uh, even at the aggregate level, what you what you do observe, right? I mean, 
what, where this this pressure, uh, at least in the United States, seems to manifest more, is in terms of the wages. Yeah. Right. So we have this wage inequality debate. Uh, the the that the skilled wages to unskilled wage uh, uh, ratio has been rising uh, yeah. uh, continuously. I mean. Some exceptionally uh, periods have been there, but uh, broad broad trend, particularly if you really take from late 1970s to um, 2000 or something, you know, uh, you you see that uh, the the uh, so called skill premium has been on the rise, yeah. uh, and and so it's at the bottom, which is where you really care for people, you know, that's where the poor people are. Uh, uh, where the wages have not risen. Uh, uh, I mean, in real terms, perhaps they have done, uh, they've risen marginally. Uh, you know, there is a difference. Oftentimes, the people conflate the relative wages to real wages. Uh, so that distinction should be made. But uh, at least the evidence I saw from some work by Rob Feenstra and all, the real wages were not uh, uh, negatively impacted. But uh, but uh, the, you know, the, 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 the wage gap is is very clear. Um, now, question simply is, is that, you know, can protection solve that? Uh, and and um, I, there is no evidence really that protection will successfully solve that problem because a lot of this, you know, at least the view of trade economists has been that the very significant part of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, shift in uh, favor of the skilled labor uh, in the wages uh, has been driven by the shift in technology. That you know the it 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 is uh, the the production processes have become progressively more and more skilled intensive, and so they have progressively increased the demand for skilled labor relative to the unskilled labor, uh, and and that is uh, the main driver of the uh, uh, wage premium or a skill premium uh, uh, yeah. in, in in the wages. Uh, so, so that's a you know uh, obviously you don't want uh, to 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 stop the technological change. Um, ultimately, it's to the good uh, uh, of uh, of everybody, but it does have that effect of of uh, of wages at the at the bottom, uh, uh, and and so that's where I and and there, there is a lot of pain. There's no doubt at the, at the bottom in in the United States, Europe, and so forth. Uh, and and something so, so it, economists have traditionally argued always you know have good social safety nets uh, uh, they don't have to be you know for political reasons maybe they have to be trade related to some degree you know but uh, uh, I think that should be more generalized because yeah. uh, uh, trade is not the only policy that is uh, at play there are other policies at play as well and technology is at play as well you know yeah. so so generalized uh, uh, social safety nets. Uh, now that's easier said than done. You know, obviously yeah. there are still a lot of things, a lot of issues that remain. Um, but you know, one can, you know, uh, blame trade. But the simple example I give is: look, you know, I mean, uh, if, if if trade had not played its big role, uh, look what happened. What would have happened to the iPhone? I mean, at the end of the day, the very fact that everybody can afford an almost, you know, in, in, in the developing in the developed countries in the developed world, uh, at least some version of iPhone everybody can afford. It's because the uh, because the Chinese manufacturing has yeah, brought prices absolutely. so far down, uh, and the massive scale. Uh, you know, if, if production had been if production of iPhone had been actually confined to the US, yeah. There's no chance. Uh, 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 I couldn't that, afford an iPhone. Then. No, no. I mean, there will not be that many iPhones. Yeah. I mean, you know, there would not. I mean, but for Korea and China and Taiwan, uh, 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 and now you know it's spreading a bit uh, to Vietnam and maybe India also and all. Uh, uh, the, you, you, but principally those three countries. But for them, um, mo- mobile revolution across the world couldn't have happened. Yeah. I mean, it's those countries that, you know, massively uh, at a very low cost manufactured these uh, mobile phones. And uh, even when we replace these feature phones by the smartphones, smartphones also be- uh, very quickly fell in cost. Uh, and, and that's because of the manufacturing prowess of the, uh, the, some, these, these countries. Uh, and, and without that, you know, and, and just imagine how much good it has done to uh, almost everybody, you know. That, yeah. uh, so... So, so uh, that kind of gets lost in 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 this, in this uh, conversation absolutely yeah. but you know i think also more fundamentally 
free trade in developing countries to switch gears back brings structural transformation, right? That's right. fundamentally what we need. And Absolutely. structural transformation is not painless. Yeah. You know, it does require people to stop doing their traditional trade or agriculture or something they've been engaged in for a long period of time and start doing something else, which is a higher productivity job. And on the one hand, we want the structural transformation because that's the path to, you know, higher GDP, higher GDP per capita, better wages and, you know, sort of like a growth trajectory. And on the other hand, it's not painless, right? So now, since that's the prescription for developing countries, it would be weird if that's not also the prescription of growth for developed countries. The yeah. margins on which they can afford to ease the distress by providing, you know, unemployment, uh, welfare schemes or universal basic income or something else. Uh, of course, that's of a different magnitude. Uh, but the prescription for growth and productivity can't be that different across both. Right. And no, if over, true. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. And and as you can see, that's a choice most developed countries have made. They have made right? it. You know, yes. they're, they're not generally impeded. Uh, you know, I mean, there are some protectionist noises here and there, but largely the markets have remained open. And uh, if you look at the flow of uh, 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 trade, that flow has not been impeded, right? I mean, they, they, if you look at the uh, 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 global exports of either goods or services, boy, they has, that has continued to, to expand. This yeah. continue to expand uh, dramatically, and, and you know, today uh, the merchandise exports is in the range of 18, 19 trillion, and services is another six trillion. So yeah. together, they are more than quarter of the GDP of the, the global GDP. So, so and then they have chosen that path. You know, they, they and and look, I mean, advanced economies certainly are in a much better position yeah. to build uh, social safety nets. I think you know the uh, tax tax revenues are quite substantial. Yeah. Uh, Even to uh, build the social security net, you need free trade and economic growth because that's what gets you the higher revenue. Right. right, right? So at some point, there is very few options (laughs) if if the goal is prosperity, you know, for large numbers of people. Right. I mean, all you can say is that, you know, if if the developed countries uh, resort to protectionism, uh, uh, the cost of it to them might be a little smaller smaller than what it is to developing countries. I think developing countries pay a huge cost and we know the Indian experience, particularly how how much we paid uh, for almost 50 years. Yeah. Uh, It's almost a luxury that only a few countries can afford and even they can't afford it for too long. Yeah. Right. Protectionism as a luxury good would, would is an is an interesting way to think about it. This is a good point uh, to set up our next conversation. I think uh, you've been very patient with us in explaining and laying the ground for arguments in favor of free trade and sort of uh, walking us through the merits, uh, mostly demerits of arguments in favor of protectionism. So hopefully we can continue this conversation in that direction. We shall do that. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much as always, Arvind. Okay, thank you.